Okay. Can you hear me? Yeah. Yeah. Good afternoon. My name is Veronica Martinez. And welcome to the IFM. Uh, I am representing the Center for Digital Value. And today we are going to talk about showing the different angles of AI and emerging technologies. To get started with that, let me just introduce a little bit of why so group. Uh, here at the IFM, what we are doing is trying to identify how digital technologies can help to create value for business, for people, and for the society. Uh, one important part of our perspective is to identify how is the interaction of humans, what, how the, the, the humans are interacting with the technologies to create this value, service delivery, user experience, better user experience for all of you. So let me just introduce uh, our team. Uh, I am going to let you introduce each one of them. So my name is Veronica Martinez. I am the lead. I am started as a chemical engineer, but then I go move into interesting subjects such as uh, applying digital technologies, particularly in heavy assets for industrial manufacturing. Now I'm going to pass to my colleague. Hi everyone, also from my side, my name is Julian, I'm actually from Germany and um, I studied industrial engineering and management, a lot more focus on mechanical engineering in my undergrads and also now I moved a little bit more to the digital perspective, so I'm working here at the IFM on the intersection of blockchain and supply chain management and will also share some insight with you about um, what blockchain is and how blockchain can be applied in the industry right now. Yeah, thank you very much. I'm the other Julian, I'm also from Germany. <laughs> Also, I studied at the KIT, also industrial engineering, but now I'm at the FAU Erlangen Nürnberg in the field of information systems. And I'm doing my PhD there, and I'm here as a visiting researcher. And I work together with Veronica on the topics of uh, digitalization capabilities, especially for manufacturing firms. How can then they move from a more product oriented business model into a service and digital oriented business model? Hello, everyone. I'm Fran. Um, I started out as a mechanical engineer, uh, and then I spent one year in the industry working with ultrasonic evaluation of pipelines and steels in general. And then I started a PhD with Veronica, uh, where I was doing my research on digital twins and how they affect the processes by which uh, people learn within their organizations. But I have just finished my PhD and now I work at the Alan Turing Institute as a research application manager. Hi, uh, um, I think I'm the only person who's not an engineer or didn't have an engineering bachelor degree. I'm actually a qualified accountant um, and I shifted careers. Um, so I work full time, I work for Unilever, heading the Global Leader platform. And I am a part-time researcher in Veronica's team, uh, looking into data strategy and emerging tech, covering especially AI and uh, metaverse. So we wanted to give you this glimpse of you as young people, you have many paths to walk. Wherever you started, follow your dreams and follow what it is interesting for you. For us, it has bonded us, uh, value creation and digital technologies. We have other people who unfortunately couldn't be here, but just to give you an example, we have a mathematician, uh, and Stephen Green is doing fantastically well in the development of AI. We have people like Neo and Equin, and they are computer scientists, and they are in charge of, like Julian, in, in blockchain. So we hope that this gives you an open your perspective so the things that you can do in future and maybe, maybe you can consider coming back to the university and do a PhD with us. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> so let me just start the, the beginning of, of our presentation. We are going to cover three important themes here. And these are the things that you will see in your lives and maybe we haven't recognized yet that we are using those. And here, my colleagues and I, we try to do the best to put you and make you very sexy, very, very eye contact, and very engaging presentations of these technologies, just to give you a little bit of introduction of what is this fantastic, uh, fantastic technologies that interact in order to day to day, day to day life. So let's get started with the first one. So, to start, let's start first with a question. That's to you. 
how are you using AI on your day-to-day -day basis or you think you're using AI? Go for it. Netflix. Netflix. Like, can you explain that? Uh, because Netflix, you can, it cho chooses like what you, what it recommends to you. So that's, I think maybe they could use AI, AI in that. That is correct. So Netflix is one of the basic uses because it's just based on what you pick and from a movie to the other or what you're watching, it just recommends something else. That's a perfect example. Who, who else uses AI? Or, yes? Uh, it's for video games. I'm sorry. Real time, yes. Excellent example again. Any other examples? So maybe we ask you, um, who of you has already experiences uh, with the metaverse? Is there anyone? No one. Obviously there's a special topic here which is new to us. Mm -hmm. So maybe we can explain during our uh, presentation a bit more about the metaverse, and maybe also about the differences to uh, a digital twin or also how AI affects the metaverse. Okay. So I'll start with the AI. I think we had a couple of great examples, but I'll give you how I use AI and Julian as well today. Um, so I woke up in the morning, I use the facial recognition on my mobile to open it and check what time it is. And then I decided to, okay, I don't know what my energy, so I traveled from London, because I live there, and I wanted to know what my energy levels are. So basically I synced my mobile, my, uh, my watch to my mobile, showed me my energy level is about 80%. So it seems I didn't sleep well last night had a proper breakfast so it can actually give me some energy. So that's straight away how AI kind of gave me some insight because it analyzed my data, it analyzed my sleep pattern, my heart rate, to give me some recommendation and show me my battery level, my, my body battery level. What about you, Julian? Yeah, so as I come from Germany, I'm not used to the English weather here. I always forget my umbrella in the morning. <laughs> and when I come to my bathroom in the morning, I always ask my Amazon Alexa, uh, and ask for a weather forecast. And uh, Amazon Alexa always proposes me a, a good weather forecast for the day so that I don't uh, forget my umbrella in the morning. So these are very simple examples of AI helping us to start our day. So this is uh, what we shared now is personal example or personal examples. What we're going to share with you are actually how also the industry are using it. I will start by, I used to work for Jackie and Andrew, so I'm a big fan, obviously. Um, I noticed that you were feeling bored. I found this cooking podcast that you might like. <laughs> Hello, yeah, sure. I'm Emily Thomas, and this is The Food Chain. It looks like your energy levels are dipping. I am activating alertness boost. So what we wanted to show you are some examples where you can actually use the AI out of this talk, hopefully you will be using AI in your day-to-day -day basis more, uh, but also for young people in the audience, think about how massive it is of a career opportunity. Uh, you can work anywhere in any industry and you'll be using AI. Julian. So we also want to show you an example of AI maybe you are not really aware of that AI is also affecting uh, our research, for example, in the healthcare industry. It has a camera, so it's seeing the same thing I'm seeing. Information is being fed into a computer, which is doing billions of calculations and telling me that's the tumor, that's not the tumor. Right now it detects breast cancer and prostate cancer, but it could also work on any other cancer type that we train models for. The knowledge that you're getting when the microscope points up cancer to you is the knowledge of many pathologists who contributed to training machine learning models. We had a team of pathologists that went through thousands of images. 
So what we have seen here is that AI can really help us in all our daily lives and also, um, for example, for our medical treatment. <coughs> So, the other technology that goes kind of hand in hand with AI is the metaverse. And it is, think about it as uh, the being in real life or in a 3D environment. So, you're in the world, but out in the world. And we'll show you some examples of those. This is an example which Unilever, it's where I work, but we, we, we did this a couple of years ago, which is a marathon for everyone. We want to be very inclusive and get everyone to run it. So what we did is we, uh, we did it in the metaverse, so basically in the virtual environment, think about goggles and actually running. And we made sure that the metaverse where people run is inclusive. It has everyone, uh, it has people with different abilities, wheelchair, um, running needs, everything there to make sure it's quite an experience. Uh, and think about it that you can run anywhere. You can run in Paris while you're here in London and in, in, in Cambridge, or you can do any marathon in the world, New York, while you're still here. Be at the office without the commute. You would still have that sense of presence, shared physical space, those chance interactions that make your day all accessible from anywhere. Now imagine that you have your perfect work setup and you can actually do more than you could in your regular work setup. And on top of all that, you can keep wearing your favorite sweatpants. Looking good. Let's get together real quick for a debrief. See how you join now. I'm free now. Let's jump in. Hi. Hey. So what do we think? It's ready. Great. I'll prep it for the presentation. All right. Good luck. Imagine a space where you can tune out distractions and focus on the task at hand. And when you're ready to share what you've been working on, you can present it as if you're right there with the team. So what you have seen here is maybe, especially for the young kids here in the room, how our work can be maybe in the future. Like having the reality but also the virtual world where we can collaborate with different <coughs> people all over the world and where we can experience our work much better, where we have much more information and can really have a targeted collaboration between different people uh, in a virtual setting. I love how you mentioned now how we're going to experience the world much better. Our world is changing and Julian is just spot on. Um, but we do really need to be very careful because as much as the virtual world is brilliant, it doesn't have everything we have now in the real world. Let me show you that video. Perfectly, and with that, I hand it over to uh, Julian. <laughs> Julian, Julian. Thank you so much for this nice uh, transition. So, um, switching to another concept that I would like to introduce to you, um, it's more of a very abstract concept. So, I'll try my best to break it down for you in simple terms. Um, but also, let's maybe start with the video first, just to give you a first impression of blockchain technology. The growth of global commerce and trade has created a network of disparate ledger systems, vulnerable to errors, fraud, and misinterpretation. 
Take the diamond industry, for example. The journey of a diamond from mine to consumer covers a complex landscape of legal, regulatory, financial, manufacturing, and commercial practices. Current supply chains have to rely on intermediaries every step of the way, from government officials to lawyers, accountants, dealers, and banks. This adds time and cost. Diamond smuggling and fraud can hamper governments from collecting fair export taxes, and consumers and retailers face the prospect of purchasing counterfeit or unethically mined stones. This is where blockchain technology comes in. It has the potential to eliminate these vulnerabilities with transparent transactions. All right, so you probably listened to that and you still have no clue what blockchain is. <laughs> so um, let's maybe break it down a little bit. Um, so the first aspect you mentioned is um, the complex journey of product from raw materials to, to final consumer. So um, each of every, each of every uh, person of you, we have like, for example, our um, phones in our pockets. Um, these new raw materials coming from all over the world. Um, along the way, they uh, change their characteristics, they change their owners, they change the company. So um, I want to emphasize first the complexity of this whole uh, setup, where our products are produced and how they collect or are they, um, how they end up at the final customer. Then, um, due to the complexity, this also leaves quite some space for errors or fraud, for example. We um, have to rely on intermediaries, so for a transaction, for example, for um, sending money from person A to B, you need them, some banks that um, facilitate the transaction, or also in the video mentioned, um, to fulfill a certain contract, you need lawyers that approve um, that everybody adheres to the contract, for example. Um, and then, finally, these consumers and also the contributors of this whole journey they all benefit from the information. So um, we take one example, say um, when we're sticking to the diamond example, we have one diamond ring and um, nobody knows where the diamond of the ring comes from and nobody knows who were the previous owners. Uh, whereas you compare it to another diamond and so this diamond has all of the characteristics listed. So you know where it comes from, from which mine, who are the owners in between, what's the density, what's the purity, for example. So um, as you could imagine, people would pay more um, for the second uh, the diamond ring than for the first one, right? And um, this is also true for other uh, assets. So if you think of a car, nobody would uh, buy a second-handed car if they didn't know like, the history of the car. So um, having that in mind, um, I briefly want to elaborate on one more concept, which is called a transaction. So what, what is a transaction? Most of you might know it from a financial transaction. So money is sent from A to B, um, from company A to B. But a transaction could also be, for example, in a board game where you play chess and the, I don't know, the knight is jumping on uh, fields 3, 4. This could also represent a transaction. So everywhere where information is transferred from one person to another, you can uh, speak of a transaction. So how does blockchain come in? So we stick to the board game example. You'll know how board, board games work. So we have some rules that everybody has to stick to and has to know them. Um, every player has to observe the game and follow its rules. Um, everybody must assume that nobody is cheated, you would somehow trust on your counterpart. But then, um, if somebody does not stick to the rules, so, uh, one person also has to speak up and uh, kind of enforce uh, that um, the rule was broken, for example. But it can also happen that the pieces are just knocked over and nobody knows like what was the previous state of the game. So, let's think of a situation where we move the um, like physical game to a virtual world. So, if you play online chess, for example. So how do you ensure that everybody sticks to the rules, everybody um, hasn't somehow manipulated um, the game because you couldn't observe them anymore? So you could kind of transfer the situation and think about an online board game of companies. So um, you cannot, um, most of the time you cannot, you don't have insights into the company, how they're operating, how their contracts are um, executed, for example. So um, here blockchain, blockchain comes in and I want to briefly talk about its values, how it can facilitate interactions and um, some of the use cases in an uh, industrial setting. So first, um, blockchain kind of has the rules of the game already inherent in the, in the system itself. That means, for example, if a trade happens between two companies, it can be automatically facilitated by the blockchain itself. Um, then you can also ensure that, for example, if you play online, that everybody has the same um, status of the game, but also the same um, information um, available at the same time. Um, and lastly, or uh, as a third point, um, it eliminates a single point of failure, meaning, uh, for example, in the uh, uh, case of the board game, if all pieces are knocked down, it's pretty hard to um, bring together or reassemble like what was the state before the pieces were knocked down. So blockchain can facilitate that and uh, allow you to trace back the previous states of 
kind of either the company or in our game uh, where the pieces were allocated, for example. Then in addition, um, you cannot dispute what was happened before, so I think you also know all of us um, played board games where there was a lot of argument with your playing partner and you were discussing now it was your fault, I, I didn't follow, you were not watching, you were cheating, something like that. So we can prevent that with blockchain as well. Um, it kind of it's maybe ties into the previous point. We, we kind of eliminate the need for a boss or like a referee. That's also, um, blockchain itself just takes care of that the whole game um, is taking place uh, in a fair way. And um, also if, for example, the majority agrees to change the rules of the games, this can also be done, but not if only or it can not be done if only one player uh, says, I want to change the game, let's do it. It doesn't work, it has to be like the majority has to agree to it. So the majority has to find a consensus, what's called in blockchain technology. And we also um, end up with a fair and trustworthy game for everyone and transfer to business to a fair um, way of doing business, um, exchanging information, exchanging assets, um, and uh, what's related to that. So um, and maybe a high level definition of IBM. So blockchain is a shared immutable ledger that facilitates the process of recording transactions and tracking assets in a business network. Um, and just briefly to dipping into the technical details, so um, why it's called blockchain. So what you basically do, if you think of a chess game, for example, or any board game, um, you would kind of batch every move of a certain player into a block. So player A takes one move, player two takes one move, player three takes one move, and then you batch it into a block, and then you perform some mathematical operations that you um, kind of makes you in, uh, secure and um, it's called hash, um, the data that is collected from these three moves, and then these are packed into a block, and then the next block is created, and uh, this block is now linked to the previous block um, by collecting um, here this hash that was generated, basically the hash is generated by performing mathematical transact um, functions on the previous three moves and link it to the next move. And then basically by these, by applying these operations you have a mutable chain, which cannot be altered. Um, and this is maybe a, a short illustration on um, how, how different users could access uh, the game. So, um, for example, in a business, um, you could send money from A to B, and um, you don't want any intermediary to read how the information is transferred. So, um, you could encrypt uh, the plain text or the data. Um, um, person A sends five pounds to person B. Um, it's encrypted, and once uh, the receiver receives um, the money, it can be decrypted with another key, and uh, he sees basically what's the amount of the transaction. So what are the major applications? Just um, briefly touching upon what's, what can we do with it, basically. So first thing we already saw in the beginning, so uh, supply chain issues, for example, for example like diamonds. Um, this can be also in the food industry, so if you think of, um, you want to know what's the origin of your meat that you're consuming, of, of your vegetables, which farmer, uh, produced it. Um, this can be facilitated by using blockchain. Then secondly, um, for example, very um, sensitive information about uh, health records. So uh, sharing data between um, medical um, doctors or patients, for example. And then lastly, in banking, which I already touched upon, so just sending money from A to B, which eliminates the need of banks, basically, because uh, transactions can be automated. And um, yeah, so no central institution is required anymore to um, Oh, it was understandable. <laughs> so, yeah, so we'll hand over to the first one. Thank you again. <coughs> Hi again, everyone. We're going to move on now to digital twins, the final piece of technology here. Uh, we, I'm just going to quickly explain what digital twins are, and then we're going to run a bit through what we can do with this piece of technology, um, what the possibilities are and then close up with some questions about what, what, what makes digital twins interesting and what are the things that we have to consider when uh, implementing them. But first off, what is a digital twin? Um, think of it as a digital copy that you make of something that already exists in real life. So let's take my car, for example. <laughs> um, a digital twin of my car would be a digital copy of it that I store in my computer. And this digital copy uh, will allow me to see how the car is changing in real time and throughout its uh, life cycle. And you can do a lot of cool stuff with that. So you can, if you have a digital twin, then you can ask it things like, how fast is my car going? 
um, how hard uh, have I been braking? Uh, what color is the paint of my car? Is the engine going to explode? Uh, things like that. But also, having a digital twin allows you to uh, predict, without having to touch the real car, uh, what making changes to the car, uh, will, uh, what effect it will have. So for example, you could ask questions like, if I change the tires in this car, uh, is it going to make the car more slippery, or is it going to make it more grippy? Or if you change the mappings of the engine, is it going to make the, the car faster, or is it going to make it less fast? Uh, things like that. Think of it like a, almost like changing the settings uh, in a video game. Um, okay, and the digital twins are already being used in many uh, industries, like Formula One, for example. So here we have um, a small slice of the data that, for example, is collected from a Formula One uh, team while whilst they're during a race. So here we have on the left, left, yeah the left, uh, the car of Jensen Button, and here we have the car of Lewis Hamilton, and here they're collecting data like how, the, how fast the cars are going, uh, where they're accelerating, where they're braking, so that then the engineers can go back and see how Lewis Hamilton can drive faster so that he can catch up to uh, Jensen Button. Um, but then also, the engineers uh, in, in the Formula One team, the race engineers, can look uh, into many other things. They, they can uh, use the digital twin to then adjust their race strategy in real time uh, predict how, by predicting how the tires are going to change, seeing how the brakes are overheating, and even looking at how much time the engine has left before, well, before they have to change it and it doesn't break down. But the applications of digital twins don't stop there. And I'm going to leave it to Veronica to speak a little bit more about more applications. Thank you very much. Uh, first of all, uh, shall we say hello to the Queen? The Queen just joined us, is part of our team, and he is another person that works in blockchain. Uh, he just came a little bit late because he was in a hackathon. Surely he was coding a lot. So, but uh, you will hear from him, he, or you can ask him questions. So, to follow up with Francisco's uh, introduction of the digital twin, I am going to talk about aerospace, and I like big assets. And remember that I start this talk by saying we are interested in how humans interact with technologies, technologies like this. So here we have a fantastic example where in this side we have the real asset. And basically to create the digital twin and to identify how that, how that asset is doing, what we do in real life, if you can imagine, we create first of all a map and we identify what are the most sensible points that we wanted to learn from an airplane. So if you have the option, Hanson, who can tell me what would you want to twin in, a, in, in an airplane? Come on, yes? The engine, fantastic, kudos points for you. And you're going to have a double suite, which are at the back there. <laughs> so uh, if you leave us a note just saying, if you have enjoyed, then you can grab your suite. Any other issue? Any other? Yeah, first the, the gentleman on the back, and then we will come. The, can you shout a little bit louder? Yeah, very good. The gentleman? The air friend. Thank you very much. Fantastic examples. So the first point of contact is identify what it is important to twin. And then secondly, we need to identify uh, why it is important to twin it. How this can help us to make the plane a little bit safer, uh, run faster. Yes, we have a question here. Oh, I was, I was just saying, say, I was just about to say, like, you, you could just, uh, the air, uh, digital twin, the airplane engine would be useful because then you could figure out how to make the plane faster, quieter, and more efficient. Thank like you. That. What is your name? Uh, Jay Krish. Why don't you come and present for me? <laughs> <laughs> and he's totally right. So this is why we want it. So once that you identify the key points, you need to identify the technology and how we are going to do. So we use many uh, smart sensors. Uh, and this is what helps us to create that transition between reality and how we can, we can look at the reality from the virtual model. Here we're going to play a small video for you. 
Can we just click it? Oh, yeah. We have an engine, like it was mentioned. So the interesting part is that you wanted to look what is physically operating, and then you will have the digital twin next to it. Why is this important? We mentioned safety is important, how fast, how quieter. If we think about the life cycle, like the plants, you start and you start growing, and do you move, and then eventually you give a lot of fruits, and then eventually we will have to end up. It's the same for engines, and it's the same for, for materials. So what we are trying to watch out is that if we can identify and capture all these problems that are happening in the different life steps of, of, this, of this engine. So when it gets new, it is very fast and running, there is no problems. But then as the engine, it gets a little bit more in use, you need to do more predictive maintenance. So you don't want that the engine just drop. Yeah, we don't want that, isn't it? Yeah, it would be a little bit of a, 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 bad, a bad day. So what we want is that the engine keeps continue flying and that this gives us prediction through the model, the models, the simulations, the verifications, and this will affect the design of our next product. So you will start identifying what is the life cycle of the asset in order to make the next generation of assets smarter. And that they will identify all the things that has been said before. We want it quieter and faster, and we want it to be safe and reliable uh, products for us. And I think that I am passing to Francisco now. Yeah, and this is also the case for many other, uh, well, many other situations. Here, for example, we have a, a wind farm in South Korea, and there's a company called Bentley Systems who have made a digital twin of that, of that power, um, wind turbine farm. And they can see how each turbine is operating in real time. How much power is it generating? And that allows the company to see, well, how efficiently is this turbine operating? Is it producing as much power as it could be producing with the wind that we have right now, with the uh, environmental conditions that we have? And then the company can then, uh, from, well, from their control room, they can adjust um, the real turbines so that they can uh, produce as much power as they could possibly produce. <laughs> like they're showing over there. <laughs> but then, also, uh, we have digital twins. Uh, for those who like football, those who like sports, we also have digital twins. So there's this company who has been working on creating <laughs> digital twins of stadiums. Don't ask me what stadium that one is. I can't actually remember. Uh, but what they're doing is that they, uh, they collect data of the stadium in real time so to see like, how many people are sitting, where they're sitting, so that over time they can predict better uh, where people are going to sit, um, what they're likely to order or their uh, favorite um, football drink. But also football teams are uh, creating digital twins of how their players are playing. So they put sensors inside the football, inside the ball itself to see how fast the ball is moving, uh, where the ball is going while uh, each player is, is uh, moving around with it. So that then the football team can tell their players how they should be improving how they, uh, how they play football. And then also in our uh, research group, uh, uh, Stephen Green, who we've talked about before, uh, he's been working on creating digital twins of humans. So we've been uh, recording videos of, of people walking so that we can analyze how, uh, how they walk. And by doing that analysis, trying to predict how the way that they walk can affect their health conditions in the future. And, but also we can work the other way around. By, that by looking at how they walk, we can also try to assess what conditions they could possibly have with the idea of uh, eventually uh, reducing the amount of time that clinicians uh, and doctors <coughs> need to assess what a patient's, um, well, a, a patient's health actually is. So we talked a little bit about the cool stuff that you can do with digital twins and, uh, well, uh, all of the opportunities that are opened up when you create digital twins of things. But actually, digital twins are complex. 
they can be expensive. So you have a lot of questions that you have to ask yourself uh, when you're uh, working with digital twins, like how detailed should you make a digital twin? What parts of the real thing do you have to twin? How often should you update them? Can you trust what the digital twin is telling you? Things like that. Um, but digital twins are cool. You can do lots of stuff with them. So I'm just gonna leave this question with you uh, uh, to think about. Like, what would you like to see uh, as a digital twin? What would you like to twin? And we have a, a little board over there that you can put, put your ideas. And uh, let's see what you come up with. And uh, while you think about it, I'm going to leave you with Fatima, who is going to give us a quick wrap up of what we've talked about. And then we'll move on to the questions. Cool. Oh, I have one more. Oh, OK. <laughs> Thank you. OK. So just a bit of a wrap up. Um, first of all, that picture there, actually, um, it was created by Copilot. So AI has created it. I haven't done anything. Asked my AI, said I wanted um, a picture to wrap up this presentation, and it came up with that. That's how smart AI is. Uh, so to wrap this up and to remind you again, we walked through several technologies. We walked you today through artificial intelligence, the metaverse, blockchain, and ended up with the digital twins. There's so much opportunities. Um, if you're still starting your career, or thinking about your career, or even in your career, like I was, moved from finance, moved to engineering, there's so many opportunities out there. Um, and also, we would like you to use it in your day-to-day -day basis. Technology is your friend. It's there to enable things for us. Just make sure that it don't end up controlling you. Okay? <laughs> With that, um, I want you to please, first of all, thank you very much for being with us today. If you have any questions, uh, we'll have a mic, we we'll go through it, we'll, yeah, we we'll go into your questions. There are some sweets, feel free to take some before you leave. And uh, if you can leave a note with your suggestions, questions, if you want to contact any of us on the research group, please don't hesitate. Uh, we're all kind of evangelists for technologies we're really uh, passionate about. Thank you very much. Any questions? <laughs> Bequini is going to, to be leading the questions and answers. Uh, we will, uh, Fatima and I, we will run in with the mic of Fatima just to make other people uh, answer okay. the questions. Or, or maybe you take this. Okay. You take this. <laughs> but I need to put this. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. Yeah. So, do we have a question? <laughs> yeah. Hold on a second. <coughs> Can I ask a question about the definition of AI? Um, obviously, companies is, is the sort of buzz phrase of the, of yeah. the moment. And lots of companies are trying to use it in every context. Um, take the, the video of the, of the Jaguar, for example. Um, what makes that AI versus just good technology? Okay. Uh, Fatima, would you like to, yeah. to get us started? And then maybe... So, think about artificial intelligence as... Um, creating a technology that thinks instead of a human. So what the example of Jaguar Land Rover here, instead of someone looking at the person who's driving and saying, oh, you're exhausted, you have the technology that thinks. So first of all, it recognized that that guy is sleepy. So that is really uh, tricky because he's on the road. So it told him, oh, you're sleepy. Now I need to get you awake. And then it took a decision to play something to make that person awake. So it took the decision, so it's thinking like a human, mimicking, mimicking a human brain, and then it took an action. The difference though between AI and a human brain is we have emotions. So we can actually take decisions and take into account human beings, while the AI will not take into account that. Does that answer the question? Which have a complementary? Now I have two more people might see. <laughs> so, yeah, I think that covers it all. Just uh, from another perspective, AI is just an umbrella term for different types of algorithm, and the important thing is that they are learning. So it's not, ju not just an algorithm that is like logged in and does its job. It's more about that it's a learning algorithm that based off data and more and more data, they become better. And that's the important thing that AI is, and not just an algorithm. 
the final thing uh, for that, uh, the final thing for the human AI to add is that AI is always trying to make a better user experience. Whatever you are doing, even if you are driving, all the data it will collect it to make a better user experience of whatever you are doing. Thank you for the question. Just following on from what you said with regards to the emotional intelligence, do you think it will catch up to incorporate that as well as it learns more and more about facial features or anything else like that, or just a person being able to live had a bad day? How far do you go from that? Uh, so there are two aspects, the soft AI and the hard AI. So the one that has emotions and the one that doesn't have emotions. The one that doesn't have emotions, we are, we're not 100% there, but mm -hmm. like, what happened today, like you can see that it's taking decisions, it's taking actions. So we are close. The one that has emotions, we're not even there yet because it is how can you embed the emotions into the artificial intelligence to make it actually feel like a human without harming, it's just quite, it is quite complex and we're not there yet. Yeah, and maybe also to catch up um, on that, it's all about uh, calculations and uh, the probability of like the cause and effect calculation at the end and sometimes you just decide on what is maybe not the right decision in the first place because maybe it's a crazy decision and it's very risky and that's very hard to implement in an algorithm when it's a learning algorithm so you always have a gut feeling of a decision and that's very hard to implement in an AI so it's a long way to go there. The technology is not there yet, we'll get there. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Situation where we're going to, you know, like I, I would like to um, ride around the garden of earthly delights on a fish, and I'll only take public transport because there's just not enough energy to go around. You know, we have to decide which which are our priorities. Only use the computer and, and never use a private car or something like that. Is that, is that Let's get a subject with Francisco. So, thanks for the question. And uh, Bitcoin is only one type of blockchain. And uh, the reason why a Bitcoin takes more energy is because this consensus algorithm from Bitcoin is like how they reach this agreement, like uh, in a group. They are doing this computation to, you know, who do the computation early got uh, the you know, reward for the ability to you know, say the thing in the group. And uh, everyone wants to take the control and everyone will have more computation to you know, calculate this. In that case, that takes more power. However, apart from Bitcoin, there are other you know, ways to negotiate within the group. For example, there are like proof of stake, which means you know, based on how much like, essentially contribution you already invest in that uh, protocol or in this community, you have this stake. There are also this proof of authority. They are mainly used in this enterprise network, where, for example, within one supply chain, there's one you know, upper stream supply chain supplier and the uh, lower stream retailers. There will be some uh, business encoded authorities within this uh, you know, network. So in that case, it's not hard to reach this consensus. So it's not necessary all blockchain is like energy like uh, intensive. It's mainly depend on the use cases. Bitcoin is only one of it. Yes. Excuse me, would you like to continue that? Yeah. So um, it's mainly about the, the incentive mechanism on how to find uh, consensus. So basically the Bitcoin uh, concept is a bit of an outdated concept to how to find consensus because as you correctly mentioned, it's very energy intensive. So. Um, the, the incentive for people to participate in finding consensus is basically um, how much computation power does one person have. So the person with the most computation power um, is eligible to kind of improve, uh, approve a certain transaction. 
whereas uh, newer, um, like more recent uh, algorithms, which are also used within companies, they um, don't rely on this computation aspect anymore. So uh, you kind of completely almost remove the energy aspect um, and replace it basically in a, com uh, in a um, company setting, for example, you can replace it by just proving that certain organizations exist. So um, if three suppliers are in a supply chain, um, you have one external party that just says, okay, we have um, supply A and B, we know that these are actual um, corporations and we um, kind of certify that they exist. And then um, you can just have a digital signature of this company um, approving a certain transaction, which, which basically doesn't require any like energy at all. It's more about um, digital encryption and um, handling identities of certain organizations, for example. Does that make sense? And with that, we are going to, I will invite all my colleagues uh, here at the, at the middle of the, of the room. Um, and we wanted to say, we want to say thank you very much for listening to us. We are going to be here. Talk to us. Take, talk to the younger ones if you want. <laughs> Leave us messages there and don't forget your sweets. And hopefully we will see some of your faces coming when you are selecting a career. Uh, hopefully this could be inspiring for you and a little bit of learning element in, in your afternoon. Thank you very much and have a good day. Thank you.